Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 39 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zeki Hassan. You know, it's funny, it's been so long since we recorded, I literally forgot what our intro is, which is why I was just pausing there for a second. <laughs> but regardless, I am Zeki Hassan, and that person you just heard is Pervez Ahmed. We are back. It's been a little while. Pervez, how you doing? I'm doing very well. I, I think it's, it not only has it been a very long time, I think a lot has happened since we were last recorded, you know, since our last episode. That's true. Apes so, have taken over the earth. And, uh, <laughs> we are inching closer towards a Trump presidency. No, God forbid. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, it's, I think uh, it was Ramadan when we were last together. Uh, we, were, we had a great uh, episode uh, conversation with Zarka. Um, and, but, uh, of course, like I said, uh, we had the rest of Ramadan to go. We had Eid. And then uh, somebody made a, somebody, uh, somebody, I think it was Mr., what is it, Mr. Uh, Washington goes to, no, Mr. who goes to Washington? Uh, well, Mr. Hassan went to Washington. That's right. Well, in this case, Mr. Hassan, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, so so a couple of weeks ago, I received an invitation in my email that said, uh, Dear Mr. Zaki Hassan, the president would like the uh, honor of your company at a White House reception for uh, Eid al-Fitr. Right. And so when you saw that, you, might, you were like, well, instead of saying Mr. President, it could have said some Nigerian prince, for all you know. Yeah, so I was, I, I was basically like, okay, let me mark this spam. Oh, yeah, and, and what was the RSVP again? Yeah. yeah, it was basically send us your social security number, your date of birth, your country of birth, your nationality, your, you know. Uh, Name firstborn. Uh, yeah, <laughs> send us your family tree, send us, you know, in both directions. And, and so I was like, yeah, sure, okay, why don't I just send you my security code on my credit card while I'm at mm-hmm, it, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but then as it happens, and so literally I, I didn't give this thing two looks and I was two seconds away from spamming the email. <laughs> I mean, and, and then I, I saw, uh, Rabia Chaudhary, previous guest was like, I oh, got invited to the white house. And then what, yeah. uh, Thali, previous guest got invited to the white house, <laughs> you know, uh, Willow Wilson, et cetera, like people who are not, uh, drooling morons. <laughs> and so I'm like, okay, well, obviously they must know something. And then I, and then I texted, uh, Shahid the Manala, another guest. I was like, okay, so I think this is not true. And he's like, no, no, it's true. Come. I'm like, now bear in mind, Shahid has worked at the State Department. But even yeah, then, I'm exactly. like, are you sure? Right. Um, so so once, I got, once I received diffused congruence from multiple sources. <laughs> there you go. Nice one. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> um, I, I, I figured, okay, I think this is the real deal. So I booked my ticket and I made my plans to attend this event. Now, of course, as it happens, tr- getting to the event proved uh, sort of uh, uh, kind of like my, a real life version of planes, trains, and automobiles for me. Right. Because uh, I was now my flight was out of Oakland at 12:30 in the afternoon, and wouldn't you know, at noon, uh, Southwest Airlines their entire computer network crashed. Right. So the check-in computers, the online, the the website, the app, the works, you name it. So of course, right. the, what was supposed to be like a three-hour flight to Dallas, and then I catch a connection to DC, became literally a 24-hour ordeal that involved me. And I, uh, I, you know, camels at some point. I mean, just just trying to get to Washington. Right. And right. I literally, I checked into my hotel at 1:15 p.m. I had enough time to shower, put on my suit, and then leave at 2:15 p.m. to get to the White House reception at 2:30 p.m. Shower and changing. Uh, that was a national security alert. So I'm glad you. I'm glad you followed through with that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, I, I mean, jokes aside, I mean, after a 24 hour journey, I, you know, I, I don't think that that's too hyperbole to say that. <laughs> yeah, it was. I mean, and, and you know what I realized is because I, I spent uh, that night sleeping on the terminal floor in Dallas and I'm just right. and I'm looking around at all these people sleeping on the on the floor. And I'm just like, after about three hours of doing that, I literally could not move. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, I'm just too old to do this. I know. I remember. I think I was texting you, and you were like, "No, I'm stuck here. I'm grounded here in Dallas." You know, the yeah. DFW. And I was like, well, "I was just like, look around the corner. You might find. You might bump into Dale Griffith, and you can, you know, Griffin, and you can go share a hotel." You That's know? right. Those uh, aren't pillows. <laughs> <laughs> I think the worst part for me was being stuck in Dallas. Being and as you know, if you, you well, you know this, and if you listen to the show, being as big a Dallas TV series fan as oh, I am. Oh, there you go. And I couldn't go to South Fork. No, you couldn't. Yeah. So, yeah. But uh, regardless, I had that experience. It was. It, I'll tell you something. It was truly uh, humbling to be there. The the array of people that were there 
what I mean, it, it was real. I and I've said this, and I'm not even trying to humble brag. I feel like I sort of got in under the wire. Like I feel like they had like you know a bunch of slots to fill, and then five like pity slots. <laughs> Yeah, no, like, I, I mean, uh, yeah, I'm glad you were able to go. And yeah, there was sort of a veritable who's who there. It and really uh, I know a lot of people who did go. So, uh, it, yeah, it was excellent. Who's including who, a lot and of. Then, and then when I showed up, it was who's that? <laughs> who's who and then who's that? Yeah. But like you said, a lot of, uh, a lot of friends of the show. Uh, CD were there, Sarma so, Cannon was there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Mah- Muhammad Ali's daughters were there. I mean, again, it's literally, it's like, here's Muhammad his whole, Ali's daughters. Well, I, his whole family. And I, I saw Lonnie. Lonnie Ali was yes. there. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, uh, yeah. Ibtahaj Muhammad, the, uh, the fencer. Yeah. Was right. there, and then movie critic guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully we'll have some. You know, you've gotten some good uh, cards and exchange uh, networking and contacting and contact information. So we, we've got a, we've got the next year planned out, right? So in terms of uh, uh you know, back to back guests. So there you go. Yeah, uh, absolutely. In I'm... that spirit, going from something as quintessentially American as the White House to going back to Canada, as it were, because our last guest was Canadian, right? Zarka's uh, episode. And so we're kind of following in that same vein again. <laughs> this is true. Uh, uh, Canada is the gift that keeps giving as far as this show goes. <laughs> Uh, well, our guest for this episode is somebody who we've been wanting to have on for a long time, and yes. and he is somebody who I have known for uh, the vast majority of my life. As I realize now, I've I've known him <laughs> since I was in single digit years. Wow, so great. long time. Uh, and and this is our, our guest is of course Nadir Khan, com- Canadian Muslim singer songwriter, arts educator, social activist. Now, over the last twenty years, he's toured and performed across Canada, USA, South Africa, UK, the West Indies, Australia, Malaysia, and Singapore in solo performances and on tours with other internationally renowned artists and scholars. Now, there has spearheaded various social justice initiatives that promote local and international relief efforts through Islamic devotional music, arts, youth engagement, and inspiration. His second album, Water, was released in May of last year to widespread critical acclaim. 100% of the album sales of Water, by the way, will be going to Water Aid Canada. Now there's an Ontario Arts Council arts educator delivering workshops on drumming, Islam, and music, as well as social justice in schools throughout the greater Toronto area. Could not be more excited to have him joining us. Nader, welcome to Diffuse Congruence. Thank you. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. It's, it's uh, an honor to be here. I've well, uh, seen your entire guest list. Um, and I sort of feel as you have felt when you were in the White House. Um, although it's a good thing you had time to shower because your country has these weird signs in your airports. You know, if you smell something, say something. <laughs> so I, I, I'm sure that that policy is like active in the White House as well. So it's a good thing you showered before you went. <laughs> That, that that's very true, and I'm grateful I had that opportunity because I think had I had I pulled up to the White House after the 24 hour of of just unending travel, I would have been led away. The Secret Service yes. would have dragged me away. Yes, yes, mashallah. Yeah. So uh, before we get to I guess the part of your life now there that uh, either fortunately or unfortunately uh, overlaps with Zucky's, uh, <laughs> where, where, where where does uh, uh, as I often I like to ask, what's your origin story? Where do you hail from? Uh, what's your background? Kind of tell us a little bit about that, maybe starting oh, off. Yeah. That's a long answer. Okay, let's try oh. this. Yeah. I was born and raised in Hyderabad, India. Get out of here. Okay, great. Well, uh, uh, welcome, fellow Paisan, uh, Paisano. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I, I grew up over there for about uh, 11, 12 years of my life. And then as a family, we moved to Saudi Arabia. My father had been working there since before I was born. And so uh, we moved over there for our schooling since grade 7 to about grade 12. And then after that, I was 17, we migrated to Canada. And I continued my... Uh, I, I, mean, I never went to high school in North America. And I went straight to university, and I've been here ever since. Oh, there was about four years in the middle when I was back in Dubai and, and, and Oman. But um, I'm here. I've been here ever since 2008 now. So, yeah. Okay, 2008. So until that time, you said you were um, uh, in, in, in the Middle East? No, no. I was in India, in the Middle East, and I was here in 1993. Oh, okay, 93. Uh, right, right. And then you were in 2004, I was here. And then about four years in the middle, I was away. And then, and then I came back in 2008. Uh, and just based on that, I take it, and knowing a little bit about Zucky, uh, the bare minimum, um, <laughs> I, I take it you guys overlapped 
in your earliest stint in the middle in Saudi Arabia then? Oh yes, uh, it was in Riyadh, uh, you know, deep in the heart of Najd. Uh, and uh, <laughs> which I want to pick up on that conversation. So let's just yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And and uh, our families knew each other, and uh, you know, uh, you been you know we'd meet, and the, all the adults would be having adult conversation. All the all the aunties would be talking about religion, and all the uncles would be talking about politics. Um, the kids obviously didn't belong in either camp, so we'd sit in the ro- in our room playing computer games. And, yeah. uh, computer games. I was going to say, what, 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 is a, what is the early childhood of a future film critic uh, and communications professor and a future artist look like? You know, so yeah. <laughs> Our computer games, dude. I mean, everything from like flight simulators to like uh, Prince of Persia to everything in the middle. Uh, Zaki, of course, was a gifted uh, illustrator yes. from as far back as I can remember and an avid comic book fan. <laughs> so nothing changed. Have, no. <laughs> I'm glad nothing has changed because it was pretty cool back then too. <laughs> you know, it's funny. You're, you're talking about computer games. It's like I was trying to explain to somebody how we used to play games on floppy disks, and you would have to ch- switch out the disks. Oh my god! Yeah. <laughs> oh, you know, you if you if you're if you had four megabytes of RAM, yeah, and forty megabytes of hard drive space, you were the baddest kid on the block. Yeah. Seriously. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It is I mean, so funny. You yeah. had like ten floppies for a game, and you just like yes, you just constantly be be switching out these discs. Yeah. And the floppies were actually floppy. That's right. Yeah, this is even before they became the smaller sized. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. The four inch as as opposed to the eight inch ones. No, no, <laughs> five and quarter. Let's Sorry, get it five, right. right, right, right. Five and right. quarter. Wow. Double sided, double density. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Which is the biggest scam there was. <laughs> so yeah, so you guys go wait, yeah, that 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 far back. Now, um, now, now, now I guess you know Zucky shared his experiences a lot, and obviously everyone has unique experiences. But uh, uh, you know, maybe tell us a little bit about your experiences growing up in, like, as you as you said, you know, Nudge, the heart of Nudge, in Riyadh, uh, the, the the capital of the kingdom, as it were. Um, how was that? It was um, it was interesting. Um, you know, the, the disparity of the experience you have based on whether your passport is South Asian or North American is huge. Um, so, um, I, uh, you know, in that region, uh, until my passport was Hindi, you know, you'd be, you'd be seen as uh, one level above black people. Oh, yeah. Right? Uh, who have it, you know, pretty bad over there as well. And, 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 but uh, and as soon as your passport is American or Canadian... Um, you know, everybody's falling at your feet, as it were. Um, but uh, I think, you know, you know, based on, like, I mean, if, specifically about my, de- my own development as an artist, um, you know, in India we had, you know, uh, it was pretty much Bollywood at which, with very little, you know, exposure to Western, uh, you know, sound. Um, Riyadh is where I discovered Madonna, Stevie Wonder, Lionel Richie, heck, even Michael Jackson. <laughs> and in fact, this was the time when there was a fatwa against listening to Michael Jackson because somebody had opined that the king of pop was the Dajjal himself. <laughs> wow. This is true. This is absolutely true. Zaki, wow. tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, no, I, I, yeah, I can back you up on and, and, and it. Was in, uh, and Zaki will know this, remember this. It was in Shola Shopping Center. Oh, yeah. In, 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 you know, in some, you know, some like audio music store in the back of the mall where yeah. this Filipino dude sells me my first copy of Bad under the counter looking, you know, shiftily here and there. <laughs> and it's and, a bootleg copy nonetheless too, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah of course, it's a, everything there was a bootleg copy. Everything was bootleg, it, yeah. It, there, was no, there was no official position regarding copyright laws, right? So even the computer games we spoke about earlier, all of them were bootleg. <laughs> Right. right, and Zucky talks about his experiences of watching bootleg copies of like '80s classics movies. You know, that, oh, heck you know yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and and then uh, you know, it was it was there that I uh, uh, that I really you know developed as an artist in many ways because it was there that I taught myself how to play the keyboard, uh, and I would do live Bollywood gigs in like these gated compounds wow. uh, with my brother. Uh, this and you know, all, in the background uh, all the time there was this, you know, there was a family connection to Islamic spirituality, uh, but there was no active involvement as such. 
Um, you know, Ramadan, everybody would get serious, and then after that, they would start slacking off again. Yeah. Um, and that was, um, it was weird. You know, you're kind of growing up, and you're trying to discover your own, you know, your, uh, you know, your own, like, your own path. Uh, but you don't even know you have one. And you're trying to f- figure out, you know, where it is you fit in and how it is you fit in. And that was um, even further agitated when I moved to Canada. Uh, but I guess that's a, you know, diff- different segment, perhaps. But like speaking specifically about Saudi Arabia, it, it, was, it was very interesting in many ways. The school that I went to with Zaki and his brother um, was, um, you know, a, a, re- a real exposure to multiculturalism in a very small place. Um, I mean, growing up in India, in Hyderabad, we had like many different religions, many different kinds of people, but it was still, you know, people from the same city, from the same more or less similar culture. Right. And then moving to Saudi Arabia, I was in the Indian school uh, until grade 10, and this was people from all over India, like literally all over. And if in case, you know, in case people aren't aware, India has... 1,400 officially recognized languages, not dialects, actual okay. languages, right? Oh, yeah, right. Um, now, so this was, like, in many ways, very, very multicultural from where I was coming from. But it was like a gradual, like, awakening of, of this, you know, uh, of understanding and dealing with diversity, right? Because from there, I went to, uh, you know, the, uh, the other school for grade 11, 11 and 12. And here, you know, you're connecting with people and cultures from literally around the world. Mm-hmm. You're connecting with Pakistanis and Arabs who had lived in the West and were back here now. And they were culturally Western, but they were also, you know, spiritually Muslim. And they were, you know, in some ways culturally Eastern as well. And there was this weird blend of both worlds. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then from there, I move on to Canada, which is, uh, you know... A, a whole other level of <laughs> multiculturalism, right? Certainly, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you kind of come into it gradually. That's that's it's, it's a really good point. Um, and and I and I especially appreciate you saying that, and you know, coming from the fact that, uh, or like you stated, you know, even though you're you know being from India, which itself is relatively diverse compared to <laughs> say other homogenous or more homogenous Muslim majority countries, India by not you know India being uh, a Muslim minority country, but nonetheless, you know, you still kind of uh, tend to, you know, uh, tend to move around within your own sort of like, you know, uh, people of your own homogenous background. So Right, but like culturally, it's very, culturally. very, like even right. in the city, it's very diverse. Right, right. So so then uh, going back to you, you talking about your early sort of genesis as a musician, then uh, sort of coming into this kind of coming out of this Bollywood uh, and then, yeah, or no, sorry, because yeah, beginning with this kind of introduction to Western music, but also with that sort of filmy Bollywood kind of background. Mm-hmm. Um, but obviously that's not where you are as an artist now. So where, where, you know, I guess what I'm asking is like, how, how, how does then your own sort of spiritual path, uh, you know, where does that take you? And again, I, you know, curious, given the fact that does some of that take place in, in, in Saudi Arabia where, you know, those, ten, those, you know, including Western music, including Bollywood music, and maybe even more so, uh, any kind of like sort of spiritual or su- like what may be often, did, you know, what, what are, can be described as Sufi practices are equally shunned. Um, let's take this in a couple of parts. First, as uh, you know, as an artist, uh, I had already begun experimenting with, you know, Western musical sounds to Eastern lyrics. Um, uh, and, and what I was listening to was really wide. Um, you know, there were, you know, I started listening to you know Motown and soul, of course, uh, along with pop. But then there was also um, hard rock. I was very much into Def Leppard, a little, in, you know, quite a bit into Guns N' Roses, a little into Metallica. And then at the same time, I was listening to Beethoven, and at the same time, I was listening to classical Indian. Um, so it really depended on, on what I was feeling like. But I had a really wide sort of, um, um, you know. Uh, you know, whatever I, I felt, you know, palatable at the moment. I yeah, yeah, sort yeah. of a very eclectic uh, very soundtrack eclectic. to your life. Very, at very much. Yeah, yeah, very much. In fact, like, in, if any of these play now in the background anywhere, I can, you know, it's such a memory trigger. It's such a strong memory trigger. Absolutely. It takes you any, right back to, so. Absolutely. Anytime Def Leppard plays, I'm back in my, in my brother's car and we're driving to school. 
Right. And I, and for, <laughs> okay. Again, without even knowing the time frame you're talking about, I'm 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 listening, or in my in the back of my mind, I'm hearing hysteria, and I'm hearing appetite for destruction, Guns and Roses. Uh, am oh I right? yes, yes. <laughs> Good because lord. That's kind of my own. Yeah, you know, we're not here to talk about me, but yeah, that's kind of my own background in music as well. Like, sort of, yeah, what I get into in terms of hard rock. Yeah. <laughs> and in terms of uh, spirituality uh, or, or or connecting with uh, uh, you know our tradition, in in it was I I don't know I suppose you know we had a masjid practically in our backyard, but we really didn't feel the. Um, uh, we, I guess on one level we took it for granted and on another level there was so little manifestation of the beauty that is, you know, that has always been in our tradition. It's almost like, you know, you know, there's these people who have a theology of misery, right? The more miserable you are, the more, you know, you know spiritual you are, right? You know, any, any fun or beauty is like taking away from, you know, like, no, 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 astaghfirullah, you can't do that. That, that, that feels so good, it must be haram, Right? Uh, that sort of the, <laughs> yeah. that that's sort of the approach that I found in my local mosque. I mean, and, and it's it's um, it feels weird to say this, but I couldn't bear to hear the azan because it was so awfully done, right? Hmm. Uh, and you know, and just the way you know kids were treated in the mosque, and you know, I was a kid back then, and just you know, uh, everything is about frowning and telling people what to do and this and that. Yeah. I, I just did not sit well with me. There was no smile, you know. There was, um, of course, you know. Given that, on top of all that, we are we are South Asian, and so you're going to be brushed aside as you know not very important anyway, not worth any attention anyway. Uh, but it was just you know the whole vibe was, uh, which is why I assume that there you know similar experiences like this uh, have you know caused a real boom in atheism in, 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 the, in the old kingdom. Um, so, the, I mean, the, the connection that I had to my spiritual tradition came in the form of poetry and came in the form of, you know, you know these, you know, kawalis and, and, and these Sufi songs. And because I didn't find any teacher or preacher that I could, you know, that I could connect to. Um, in a manner that, that that satisfies you internally, you know, that, that you hear something and, you know, it connects with your heart. I didn't have any of that unless if it was in, you know, like these Sufi-type songs, like Nusra Fateh Ali Khan, you know, these Kawali, Sabri Brothers, or whatever. Um, and that and, you know, you know, family, you know, the sort of you know, religious advice you get from family every now and then, and, you know, the, the lived cultural practice of Islam that we had. Right, um, and it didn't go a whole lot further beyond that. Mm -hmm. And when I moved to Canada, um, I guess the, the the quest, you know, you you you're in an entirely different environment yet again, um, and you know, you you if you're honest with yourself, you're gonna try and figure out who you are. And so the the quest that started off for identity eventually became a spiritual quest. And I guess it was because of a function of the people I was hanging out with, which was a real blessing. So, I mean, there's so much that you've, you've mentioned, and I, I, I promise I'll, I'll stop hogging the conversation, Zaki. And no, no, like, no. I'll, I'll turn it over <laughs> to Zaki. I'm enjoying uh, listening. No, no, I, I would just, so, many, so, so much of what you said resonated with me, uh, Nader. But um, um, where do I start? I, I think first, I think we'd be remiss not to mention the fact that a lot of what you highlighted in terms of your experiences, whether it was at your local masjid or the kingdom specifically, is, is, is not necessarily limited only to, you know, Saudi Arabia, right? Of course, of course. Right, right. So, I mean, I think that goes without staying. I don't want any of our listeners to get that impression that we're here kind of bashing on the kingdom. Um, no, that's no, certainly no, not, not the case. Yeah, yeah, that's certainly not the case. And, and, and again, I'm not saying that you were doing that now there. I just want to make that clear for the, for, for the listeners. Um, having said all of that then uh, is um, what I find interesting though is that, like you said, you know, sort of like the theology of misery, like, uh, and, and driving people to atheism. And whether that's, whether that ha is in the kingdom or, you know, 20 years ago, it's still happening all over the world now because Absolutely. of that same kind of theology of misery, whatever name you want to call it. What I find interesting is what do you think kind of kept you 
at least grounded and not saying, you know what, if I need to find beauty, if I need to find artistic expression, I have to find it outside of Islam or, or, or you know what I mean? Like beyond the, uh, beyond, beyond the parameters of Islam. Like what, what do you think kind of kept you grounded? Um, I saw, um, uh, well, I, I, this is in retrospect that I'm thinking, right? That right. I saw, uh, beauty manifests itself in poetry. I saw beauty manifest itself in song. Mm. Um, I saw beauty manifest itself in people, right? And this is not, I mean, I, and I'm thinking back, it wasn't an active choice that I made, right? But even back then, uh, you know, there was this uh, intellectual yearning of some sort to try and understand our tradition. And at the same time, there was... Uh, but it wasn't, you know, with this, you know, the fervor of a, of, of a zealot. It was genuinely trying to understand and genuinely trying to, like, keep an open mind. Um, and uh, I don't know where that came from or how it came. Mm. Um, but that's what, you know, when I think back, that's what I remember feeling. Um, I remember connecting, you know, I mean, as far back as I, as I can remember, um, lyrical content in music was always important to me. It didn't matter how popular a song was. If the lyrics were awful, I wouldn't give it a second, th a second chance. Uh, and, so, uh, and so much of, uh, I guess, popular, uh, what, what was you know, thrown around as popular songs and popular music, I wouldn't have anything to do with it because lyrically, I, I, it didn't jive with me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, and, you know, then there would be these, you know, my, my dad has always had this passion for Urdu poetry, right? So there would be these Urdu poetry um, events in Dubai that would be recorded and copies of that in, in, in Riyadh. And my dad would like rent these copies from your local video store and watch them. Back then, I hated them, <laughs> right? But every now and then, a poet in there would, would really grab my attention. And I would just sit there and listen to you know, this lyricism flow off of him. And I was like, wow, how did he make that connection? Like, you know, what a concept. Like, you know, I'd be listening. To, but and I really appreciate that experience now because if I hadn't had that experience, I wouldn't develop a taste for, for, for decent lyrics and good poetry. Uh, again, Nader, yeah, so much of what you, yeah, <laughs> just, just echo, yeah, it really just resonates with me because uh, not only coming from a very similar background, uh, you know, in terms of like sort of, you know, the religious, I want to say sensibilities of my family, but, you know, um, you know, finding beauty, not, uh, for me, it wasn't so much poetry as it much, as much as it was uh, qawalis and uh, ghazliyat, like ghazals, right? Because uh, my, my father, like you, like you mentioned yours, was very much into, like, so I, I, like, I would wake up Saturday mornings and there would be Sabri brothers or... Oh, wow. If I, if I can take it even further back, Nader, and I, I, I'll, I'm curious if you'll catch this reference, but Ahmad Khan Varsi. Of right? course. Of co oh, my of good body. Lord. Of yeah. course. So, Kaptak Mere Maula, like, kind of oh, becomes my like, goodness. Anthem. Yeah, man, I'm, I'm old school, dude. So, so oh, oh, I, I, uh, I have all of those, dude. Like, I have all, uh, almost all of his recordings. You know, and, we, so, like, I'm, I'm working on rendering one of them soon. Dude, we, we'll talk <laughs> offline because his, his, his recordings are very hard to find. Yes. And, and my dad has most of them, um, you know, uh, in, in his collection, uh, but they're on spools. And I need to somehow find a way to transfer them onto, like, digital. But anyway... Uh, side conversation, but uh, so anyway, so, any, so much of what you said uh, resonates. Uh, now they're fascinating. Um, I, I, I mean, in fact, like my, my grandparents, I you know they would listen to Sabri Brothers and they would listen to uh, uh, you know uh, Aziz Khan Varsi, and you know they would they couldn't help themselves. They would start crying. I know, no. right? And, so, and all of that was like you know, my uncles would be talking about you know these kawalis that would make their parents cry, and then they would start. You know, if one of them would just start singing in front of me, and I'm like, wow, that sounds really cool. <laughs> like you said, I mean, crying, and I've, I've, I've seen people literally, you know, what we call hal, like have like ecstatic states listening to, you know, some of these kawalis, man. I mean, uh, you know, really a joke society, right? So, uh, but yeah, anyway, separate conversation. So, yeah, so, so now this is kind of, 
you know, all of this is sort of being fused together. And I think you also touched on the fact that even your early musical roots, you're kind of listening to like this, this eclectic uh, soundtrack. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think all of that sort of comes to, together now um, in your own, obviously, now in your more recent developments as, a, as, a, as an artist. Um, and now yeah. you're in Canada. I mean, there, there's, uh, you know, stuff that is even inspired now, which is, um, I can almost trace the inspiration back to a Guns N' Roses song, a George Michael lyric. Huh. Um, wow. Um, and it, it's weird. Like, you know, in, in, there's a song that I put out on my recent album, which is a cover of uh, Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah. It's like a Sufi rewrite of Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah. And there's, a, there's two lines in there that refer to guilty feet. Uh, guess where that comes from? I'm never going to dance again. Guilty feet, I've got no rhythm. Oh, wow. Right? And I, I didn't, at the time that I was writing, I didn't even realize that, right? That careless uh, whisper, right? Careless yep, whisper. Yep, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, the, but the line in the song is, um, uh, at the doorstep to your abode, I dismount from the ride I rode and drag my guilty feet. Alhamdulillah. Huh. Wow. Right. Uh, the shoes come off as I knock the door, eyes downcast upon the floor, struggling to repeat, Alhamdulillah. Uh, and uh, oh, <laughs> and like, the, the, there's a song for, on my first album that came out eight years ago uh, called The Sound of Tears. To this day, it outsells any other song that I've put out, uh, on, at least in online sales. And af- a year after having recorded that song, I realized that while I was composing it, I had uh, estranged by Guns N' Roses playing in the back of my head. Hmm. Wow, that's really interesting. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, but there is, you know, there's so many things that came together for this, right? That uh, it's not just estranged and uh, and George Michael. It also. Uh, South, Indian, South Asian music. It's also you know, Turkish and Arabic music, North African, um, you know, East African. Um, and at the same time, you know, blues and rock and, and, and uh, all of these things. Things that could have only come together in Canada. Hmm. <laughs> so, so, I, I mean, I'm, I'm really interested in you know, there, there, people. There's always that question of like, oh, um, the the you know the permissibility of music in in a religious context, etc. And so, I mean, what I find so interesting here is that you're drawing on so many sources in a very you know in in a in a creative sense, right? Sort of the, the creative drawing from the creative ether that people could individually point to and say, Are, I don't know, I don't know about this, you know. And yet you're you're sort of leveraging all of these works and their impact on you in the past to create something new. I mean, it's kind of this dialectical effect. I don't know if what I'm saying makes sense. It does. Uh, I think... um... No, and I also want to say, you know, and who's to say it's just in the past? I mean, I don't want you to incriminate yourself here, Nader, but, you know, what I also appreciate is the fact is that you are drawing on these sources and you're talking about drawing on these various sources like Zucky mentioned and you're doing it unapologetically and I find that very refreshing because like Zucky said, you know, we, we, we generally, even now, in spite of, I think there's been a lot of progress in terms of Muslims, you know, in the arts and so on, but yet at the very, there, there's still that sort of undercurrent of, well, you know, like to quote Zucky, you know, maybe, maybe we shouldn't go there or whatever. I don't want to, yeah, to paraphrase Zucky. <laughs> see, uh, this is how I see it, right? There's, there's a couple of things. First, there's a fiqh. Um, and if we are being intellectually honest with ourselves, uh, there to has clarify, never ever... I'm sorry, just for the sake of our listeners, Islamic law. So let's just, yeah, say, let's just sure. call it that. Sorry. Uh-huh. Um, Islamic law, if we are being intellectually honest, in the history of all of Islamic law, there has never been consensus on the issue of what is or is not allowed in terms of musical instrumentation. Right? There are some who allow nothing at all, not even singing. Uh, there are some who allow everything under the sun. 
That's right. So it, it's now, a spectrum of opinions, to say the least. There, there's a huge. Now, it, it would be, uh, uh, again, equally intellectually dishonest for me to, for me to not mention that there, is no major, that, that there is a majority opinion. There is majority opinions, and there are several minority opinions, right? Now, in my personal practice, I don't feature uh, wind or string instruments in my work. But that's a, my decision for myself. I cannot impose that on people like my dear friend Dawood Warnsby uh, or Irfan Maki um, uh, or, or any of the other, like uh, Alman Nusrat, uh, who I met recently. I mean, Cat uh, Stevens, or, right? I mean, or, he, or he anybody, picks up right? Hard again. Yeah, he picks up, or even in the sake of, I think even in the, in the, in the example of Dawood Horn, you know, Hornsby for, for years has sort of eschewed guitar and then again, like kind of like Cat Stevens kind of picks it up again. Right. And the thing is, you know, what it comes down to is that I don't have any authority uh, to condemn the differences of opinion because people who know significantly more than me and woke up much earlier in the morning <laughs> um, have opined otherwise. Right. And so that difference of opinion that exists, it exists. Um, and, you know, following one opinion or the other does not put you outside of the pale of, of, of the tradition. Um, so my personal opinion is my personal opinion. That's what I've chosen to I implement in my life. Right. So that's just the Islamic law aspect of it. You know, but there's a different aspect of it, which is like, you know, cultural authenticity. I, if I'm being honest with myself, I am not. Indian, I am not just Hyderabadi, I am not just Canadian, uh, and I'm not just somebody who's lived in the Middle East. I am all of those, and perhaps even more. Culturally, uh, like, that's who I am as, you know, as a global nomad uh, who is feeding on and being influenced by, and now, alhamdulillah, even adding to, a global musical culture. So what I produce must authentically reflect who I am, right? Otherwise, it comes across as dishonest and people will see it for what it is, right? So it's not that I am doing anything unapologetically or that I am actively trying to do this or that. I'm just trying to be honest. Like a rose will not smell like a jasmine. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, and I'm not saying that I'm a rose or a jasmine. You know, a skunk will not smell like a deer. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, I think as an artist, it's important that you are authentic to yourself in your expression of your art. Um, otherwise, you know, it, 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 it's uh, lacking in authenticity and people will see it for the fake that it will be. Yeah, no, uh, no. again, you, you raised so many wonderful points now there, and, and, I, and I think uh, you took the conversation really kind of where I was thinking where we should go in terms of sort of um, cultural authenticity or, mm. uh, or, 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 you know, in, other, in, in another context, people refer to it as sort of like cultural appropriation where you're, again, taking these disparate influences and elements uh, of what you're being exposed to and kind of making it your own, which is the essence of appropriation. Um, so, and, and that very much kind of, I guess, it really puts us within the North American kind of context as, you know, there's a lot of people out there to kind of not only talking about it, but real actual artists like yourself uh, who are doing it. So, um, mm. uh, what, what, what do you, um, I guess, I, I don't know, it's hard, but, but what do you attribute or where do you see kind of the current state of all of that, whether it's musical expression or, you know, uh, you know, personal narratives, fiction, you know, whatever it may be, uh, people telling their own stories, expressing mm. themselves. Um, yeah, I think one would be, it would be easy not, you know, it would be easy to uh, appreciate the fact that, you know, this is something that we've been seeing in the last 15, 10, 15 years now. Uh, where we didn't see it so much in the early 90s or late 80s, certainly as myself growing up in the 80s. Mm -hmm. I can tell you guys both, as you guys were not here, but, you, you know, there was, there, was, there was none of that. I mean, you know. Of course. Yeah. Huh. yeah. So what do you attribute that to? And, and is it just a maturation in the community? Um, you know what? I'm not sure. Um, I know that my personal 
uh, journey was, uh, you know, as I was like in, you know, second uh, second year university, uh, you know, I went through this internal crisis. You know, as I said that, you know, this uh, quest for identity became a spiritual quest. And I'm trying to figure out where I am and who I am and where I fit in. Um, and I, uh, you know, it, you know, I, I started getting, I, I guess, closer to the dean. And in my understanding, I um, started stepping away from the musical scene. And I don't regret that because I haven't stepped back into uh, the, the, the kind of musical scene that I've stepped away from. Um, and so, but, you know, you'll always have this inner conflict, right? At the end of the day, the, you know, there's, there's a, such a big part of you that you are um, almost shunning. And, uh, and then I hear... Life of the Prophet ﷺ by Yusuf Islam, you know, Tala al Badru Alayna. And that, you know, I was like, wow, that, I, that is cool. I could do that. Huh. <laughs> right? And um, that really opened up a whole, you know, the whole, like, all the possibilities of like, uh, you know, devotional singing for me. And that's when I started getting into uh, all these, I, I was devouring it like all these devotional uh, recordings from all over the world. You know, I was getting into Rehan in Malaysia, to all these Hadras in, in uh, Damascus, to like Yemeni, you know, singers who were singing the Burda. I started getting into all of these things. So again, uh, you know, when I switched my listening to the devotional side, my taste was just as eclectic. And even back then, I remember mixing and matching between, you know, between different cultures and using this tune for that and that tune for this. Uh, <laughs> um, it was, it was, it was a, a real interesting. I, I, so I don't know. I think you're right in that, you know, in 80s and even up until early 90s, there was very little uh, cultural expression of, uh, you know, the lived experience of Islam, I suppose, in North America. Um, I, I don't know if you were in the U.S. by then, Perez, uh, but uh, and the, I, I imagine there wasn't a whole lot to go on. I, no, no, I, I, I was. I was I, unlike you two. Like I didn't spend a big stint abroad. I was born and raised here. So okay. So and my only stints abroad were very short. Like I spent you know two years in India, you know, and then I would visit. Although my family lived in Saudi Arabia for a amount of time, I was already in. Uh, college or what, what you would call university <laughs> by then. And so mm -hmm. I would visit only in the summers, but again, kind of, but yet still appreciating kind of what you guys highlighted in terms of experiences growing up in Saudi Arabia. Right. Uh, I mean, I, I would imagine the only like spiritual cultural anchors that you would have is the ones that are foreign to your cultural reality as an American Muslim. You would have ghazals and you would have qawalis that are from a different part of the world. But things that didn't completely speak to your cultural reality as an American Muslim. Am I, am I right in saying that? Oh, a absolutely. Absolutely. And that's why, and, and feeling really a sense of like, wow, you know, like th that, that something was missing and lacking. Mm. Uh, mm. Uh, just that there was a bereft, yeah, I don't know how to describe it, but yeah, like a void. And, yes. and, and having to just, like you said, I mean, uh, because I, I, I do enjoy music and I find a lot of beauty in music, just having to seek those things out elsewhere. Mm. Um, and to tell you the truth, you know, even the early, I mean, without getting into, you know, I don't, without mentioning names or anything, but even this sort of early musical scene, you know, growing up again, that, that, I, that began to germinate in, within the Muslim community in, let's say, the 90s, hmm. uh, a lot of it was still so, um, how do I put this? was still relatively foreign. It wasn't, you know, like you said, I mean, it, until I see artists like yourself and, and there's several others now who are, you know, appropriating, you know, uh, Western music and Western styles and, and, and maybe even in some cases, maybe not yours, but Western musical instruments, like let, let's say, um, that wasn't there, you know? And so it was a very dry uh, kind of a thing, dry, you know, musical expression, even in the beginnings. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. No, I, yeah, I, I hear you. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, I, no, I totally get it. 
Uh, you know what I mean? Like, and now we, you actually like, I mean, it's, it's even like you have so-called mainstream artists that and by, by that, I mean, you know, people like Cat Stevens or Yuna who are, you know, who are inspired or come from Muslim backgrounds. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, you know, their stuff sells, all, you know what I mean? They're, they're, they're yeah, they're, there's beyond their appeal lies beyond just the Muslim yes. community. And I yes. think even someone like yourself is, 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 is enjoying that audience now. We are uh, we are aiming towards it because I mean there's I don't I find I mean it's great that you know people who you know already uh, you know who, who follow me and listen to me are you know from the Muslim community, but the idea is to connect beyond that because sure. uh, and like you know our record label is called First Spring Records for a reason. First Spring is is a, a, the literal translation of Rabi Lowell. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. And, wow. and the point is to connect hearts to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and um, the, the point is also to connect uh, devotional singing to something bigger than that, to directly to service to humanity. Uh, so, which is why the content seeks to connect hearts to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the the, uh, the proceeds, you know, go towards uh, you know various charitable causes. Um, so, uh, I, I mean. I, I, it's. I think. Sorry, I was trying to go to a different place through this uh, uh, little uh, detour, but I think <laughs> the, the point that I was trying to get to was this, right? That if you go back to the time of the Prophet Sallam, right, the cultural expressions in that time and the language that was used in that time was indigenous to the people who were first there to receive the message. When you move beyond that, Persia was not Persian was not a, um, uh, a an Islamic language. Farsi was not an Islam, but it became one because pe there were people who took the message, who lived the message, and then they articulated uh, their spiritual realities in poetry, in art. The same thing happened in Urdu. The same thing happened in, you know, uh, you know, many different parts of the world. Is you know, there are people who lived the deen, and then they 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 sought to articulate the meanings of what they were experiencing. Right. I think in the eighties, uh, you um, English-speaking audiences that were culturally Western, there weren't a whole lot of them who were uh, who were at that stage yet. I think um, you, as you went into the 90s and the early part of this century, you started getting a whole lot more people who were doing that. Like, for example, Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad and his amazingly beautiful poetry that came out. Sheikh Hamza and the songs that he started writing. Imam Zaid and his poetry. Mm -hmm. um, all of which uh, are featured on, on, on the new album. And many other people like that, right? Many other, you know, people like Dawood Warnsby, uh, who is one of the most effortlessly eloquent people I've ever met. Uh, and, uh, you know, these are people, I think, they are a reflection of people living the deen and, and, and seeking to articulate uh, their spiritual experiences through their words. And, and I think the 80s were um, where these souls were being shaken into, you know, uh, uh, in, into a wakeful, wakefulness. And, you know, alhamdulillah, now you're seeing the fruits of that. I don't know. Maybe I could be completely wrong. No, no. I, I, it. I, I think you nailed it. I mean, it, it's almost, you know, I, I, this is, these are like conversations I'm, I'm having now with like my teenage daughter, just, you know, mm -hmm. like, I, I, and maybe this is me being, being that sort of old, old man, like, oh, you don't know how good you kids have it these days. You know, you get to hear these, you know, this wonderful music. Cause when I was, you know, when I was young, when I was your age, none of this was around, you know, that kind of thing. So so this is conversations I'm having with my 13-year-old right now. So, but I, I agree, we, we live in some pretty exciting times in terms of uh, w w what's happening right now. Absolutely. Um, and I think, and I'd love your input on this as an artist, uh, Nader, is that, you know, this is, because again, this is something I say, but again, me saying it is just m more theoretical, but, you know, is that, is that um, not only now, but also throughout history, and certainly within Muslim history also, um, you know, artistic expression, um, you know, the, and, 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 and the creative process in general, uh, you know, it, it can be messy. And by messy, I mean, 
you know, yes, you're going to, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the, you're going to enter areas where not everyone in the Muslim community or what have you feels is acceptable or is, you know, kosher or halal, whatever, you know, you know what I mean? Uh, sorry, but yeah, that's just that. part of sure. the creative so, process. Sorry, I missed what you just said. I just think meaning, sorry, which part? Like meaning that art pushes the boundaries of legality. How about that? Um, I or think what art. I think what art does is, uh, I, I guess, various expressions of art makes you question to what you have assumed to be the boundaries of legality. I don't think it pushes the boundaries of legality itself, but it makes you question to what to the conclusions that you have come to um, as to whether this is legal or even whether this is appropriate. Um, uh, you know, uh, and maybe in, in much fewer cases, perhaps, it pushes the boundaries of legality. But in most cases, it just makes you question, really, do you think there's a problem with that? Like, for example, all this, you know, uh, all these, you know, South Asians, and I'm not saying all South Asians, of course, there's many people from a South Asian background who have no problem listening to Qawwali. Uh, um, but as soon as hip hop starts playing, even if it's like, quote unquote, Islamic hip hop, uh, then they have a problem with it. Um, it, it it's uh, suddenly not considered proper. Um, in fact, I had this experience recently with an uh, with an auntie in in our community. Is that she heard you know one of the songs in my new album, and she said, "Ha, huh, beta, it's it's very nice, but since when have you started singing like black people?" Hmm, wow. <laughs> like, like what? Uh, what? Hello. Wow. Hello? <laughs> but and this auntie has no problem listening to Bollywood all day, right? Right. Uh, like so, I, I guess through through my work, one of the things that I'm doing is also making people question what they have assumed as. Like, like you've seen my pictures. There's a reason why my beard does not connect to my sideburns. I purposely remove it because I want people to. But you know the. You, you know, the, the, I guess the, the religious in our community, I want them to see me and come to their own conclusions about who, about who I am and then do my thing and make them revisit that conclusion. Right. Uh, I, I purposely don't dress in, like if I'm at home, I'll put on a thobe when I'm praying. Uh, but I'm not a public thobe kind of guy because that's not what I do. At best, I'll do a kurta on top of a jeans or, a, you know, a prayer khakis or something, right? Hmm. But I don't do the whole shalwar kameez in public thing, not because I'm afraid of it, but because, I do, A, I don't think it authentically reflects my cultural reality. But also, I want people who, who dress up like that all the time to question their own assumptions about what is proper and what, is, is, what isn't. Hmm. Okay. Um, uh, I mean, I'm not sure if I'm succeeding or if it's a futile effort, or if I'm giving myself much more importance than I should. <laughs> uh, well, I, I think, you know, you, you bring up something that I think is really interesting, and that's this notion of performing your Muslimness. Ah. Yeah, great point, great point. Absolutely, and, absolutely. You know, and, and if I can be, if I could lower the waterline, as we often like to say here at Talif, and also, uh, but, but just in the spirit of transparency, Nader, because I think you're being very candid, and I really appreciate that, you know, in terms of your beard and your wardrobe and whatnot, you know, but just, I think this is something, and, and to Zaki's point of performance, right, this is something that not just musical, like, at least, I think if we're being thoughtful, and if we're, uh, again, in the spirit of transparency, anyone who either through art or is some sort of a public figure or is, you know, involved in the Muslim community in a way that they are, uh, they present themselves to the public, uh, are probably negotiating these very same things. Of course. Um, you know, I don't like to get too bio biographical here, but, um, you know, just sort of like, take for instance, if I, if I, you know, if I'm a khatib in the local community, I'm, you know, not a scholar, but I'm a khatib, right? Yeah, as, as most of these communities have, you have these rotation of khatibs and whatnot. Some are, you know, pro some are professional imams, others are not. But nonetheless, yeah. the khatib gets up there, he's a public persona, he's a public figure insofar, in, insofar at least during that 
hour or half an hour every Friday, okay? Mm. Mm. Now, that person is making a conscious decision. At least I would hope that they are making a conscious decision in terms of, okay, what does my dress say about me? What does, am I making a statement by the way I dress or I choose to dress or not, how I choose to dress or not dress? Mm. Uh, am I making a statement about wearing a, a head covering or not wearing a head covering? I think these mm. are, I mean, I, I, maybe it's just, I don't know, is it just us, the three of us on this, on this, on this I uh, podcast? So. I, I, I don't think I, so. I, I don't think so at all. I think oh, because one of the things that you have to understand is the kind of people you're dealing with and what you want, them to, want to leave them with when you're gone. Um, I mean, if I'm, you know, like, I would consider it to be, uh, I don't know. Um, see, there's a reason why when Muslims went to China and they made their masjids, their masjids looked exactly like, you know, Chinese temples from the outside. There's a reason why Muslims, when Muslims went to, you know, South India and they made their masjids, their masjids look exactly like their temples from the outside, right? Because you're not... I don't believe, it. and uh, you know, and this is the conclusion that I've come to after having extensive conversations with people, people like Dr. Omar. You're not meant to stand out like a sore thumb just because you're Muslim, right? You're like shock value is not the way to go. Um, I, uh, you know, uh, I posted a a, a, a recent, um, uh, you know, a, a video from the Democratic National Convention of Dr. Sherman Jackson giving the ending ad- address. Um, no, the, the opening invocation, yeah. Oh, was it the opening or was it, okay? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And, uh, sorry, we just posted that on our face on our uh, Diffuse Congruence Facebook. Right, I, I posted that and, it, and it, a yeah. brother who's really dear to me uh, responded by saying reverend and question mark. Yeah, yeah. Now, it, and he's a really nice guy, right? But it, I feel that he totally missed the point. He did. And, and it's funny because I've kind of made it like, it's funny because I had a comment, I made a comment when I posted it saying, you know, reverend, quote unquote, notwithstanding. And, and, and a part of that was like to kind of maybe stir up a conversation around that because I, I've, yeah, I for one didn't have a problem with it. And I know the intent behind why they used the expression reverend. Um, but you're right. The person sort of objecting to just that is sort of missing the whole point. Well, yes, because like if you like just ask Mola on the Google uh, <laughs> and like reverend is used as a title or a form of address to uh, members of the clergy. Correct. Right? Like literally meaning, you know, somebody who is, you know, a, a, a person to be revered. It sounds like sheikh to me. <laughs> right? Like, no, Absolutely. And, but, uh, you, know, uh, you know, there are people who, I suppose, get caught in the, you know, they, who, you know, can't see the forest for the trees. Yeah. And, but it's not that they're bad people. It's just, uh, that's where they're at. Right? And uh, it, so to get stuck in, a, in, you know, specific cultural manifestations of Islam in a different time and space and think that it's completely appropriate to use those in our time and space. Um, I don't know, but I, I think if I was invited with Zaki to the White House and I went there in shalwar kameez with a massive turban and my shalwar hiked up to just below my knees, I don't see that as culturally appropriate behavior. Sure. Right? Uh, maybe others do. I don't know. Uh, but it doesn't seem appropriate to me. Right? Um, yeah. So, uh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that make, made any sense. No, it absolutely did, yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, and again, to kind of go back to a point that you teased earlier, or we kind of talked about earlier, where people, you know, aunt, you know auntie so-and-so is listening to Bollywood, but suddenly now, you know, there, there's, an, there's a musical expression that calls itself or packages itself as an Islamic, uh, you know, as an, as an expression of Islam, Suddenly, that's oh wait, what are we doing here? You know, and in that same kind of vein, the and I'm not again whoever the comment whoever the person commented on your Facebook feed. I'm not I'm not I'm not uh, I'm not you know picking on that person. I don't even know who that person is. But but it's like okay, you know, you want to cite oh well, Dr. Jackson was referred to as Reverend, but meanwhile, you know, last week at the RNC, we had we had the guy from Muslims for Trump giving the invocation. But that's okay because that person doesn't consider himself a sheikh or a scholar or a, or a, or a, or a, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's just so weird the way we make these distinctions. I mean, Zucky, I, maybe you even know the guy's name, but you, I, I'm sure I've, we all uh, saw him. pretty much in one ear out the other. 
<laughs> but that guy gave the invocation, and it was like. <laughs> well, I, 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 I you know. said that his organization—it's a typo because the it, it should be Muslim for Trump. Yeah, he is the organization, and that's yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. He's the beginning and end of the membership list. <laughs> so he was there. Yeah, he was there, Muslim guy, making the invocation. But that's all okay if it's Mr. So-and-so and whatever. But suddenly now, here we have Dr. Jackson, a reputable scholar within the Muslim, you know, within the Muslim community. And you can't and get like, past the point that he's referred to as reverend. Exactly. Exactly. That's the point. But, but just, actually, as far as cultural, you know, cultural propriety is concerned, that is the proper thing to do culturally. There you go. There right. you go. Yeah, he, yeah. And like you know, that's it's just like Sheikh. Yeah, it no, is. That, that's what the, that's what it means. Like it's so the, somebody revered. Correct. It's the equivalent. And I, and going, you know, I think we've mentioned Dr. Omer so extensively, but one of the things he always talks about is, you know, let's not um, let's not create alterity. And there's a big fifty cent word that only Dr. Omer would use in a, in a sentence, but it creates this, you know, Muslims have a way of creating this sense of alterity that is being quote unquote alternative or different, even though where it serves no purpose. Like and oftentimes what Dr. Omer talks about is in the context of this insistence on saying Allah as opposed to God. Yes. It, you know, prompting him to write an entire article about how God, you know, coming from its, its sort of, uh, you know, uh, its, you know its, its etymological roots is, is very much grounded in the same notion of Khuda in Persian. And Absolutely. Anyway, you can read the article. But the point no, no, is. No, I've read it. And I've had no, 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 like, I mean co- a sense of conversation. Of course, yeah, of course, yeah, of course. Yeah, I don't mean, I mean the listeners. But again, here we have. This idea, again, why create a sense of alterity, uh, alterity when we don't have to? There's no insistence on using God. There, you know, there's no superiority of using Allah over God or a man calling himself reverend over sheikh. Right. Like, for example, like b- back in the 80s, uh, back in the 90s, you know, Islamic management was a big thing. Islamic uh, organizational structure was a big thing. It's basically you take a business you know, textbook and you shove in a few quotes from ayat and hadith and you call it Islamic management. It just it was just really weird. Right. Uh, you know, just this this uh, neurolog- this neurotic tendency to try and Islamize everything when it's perfectly fine just the way it is. Right? Uh, oh, you're a convert? Well, your name is not good enough. Let's Islamize it. Of right? course. Uh, what? Your name is Cassandra? It's okay. We will call you Maryam. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, like, like <laughs> no, no, absolutely. And we've had people, you know, who've shared the own, their own experiences, you know, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, people who are, who are converts and, and uh, embrace the faith and having that sort of existential moment where they had to, like, choose a name, like, as if... Um, I mean, j- j- just so I'm clear, just so your listeners are clear, yeah. I'm not putting anybody down. That's right, that's right. Uh, and, but, I mean, and, uh, you know, people who, are, uh, who exhibit, uh, I guess, these character- characteristics um, may well be the most fantastic human beings in their lives, and we are not making any statements about their akhira or even about their dunya. They're, they may, you know, they may be like much, much better people than, than you or me. But there's a point that is being made here about, you know, the propriety of, you know, of, of saying certain things and, and seeing things in a certain way. That's all. <laughs> you know, wow. disclaimer, disclaimer to your listeners. No, I'm, but I mean, I think at the very least, people who listen will hope. I mean, I think people will, first of all, they'll take the context of what you're saying in, into account. But I mean, it, 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 at the very least, hopefully, it's something for people to think about, you know. And as long as, mm. uh, like we were alluding to earlier, if, if people start thinking, I mean, that's, that's something in and of itself. Mm. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. Um, so, so now you have, of course, uh, the album Water that's, that's out right now, when, and, and uh, you've mentioned the, the Leonard Cohen uh, cover, which I love. Um, uh, thank you. I listen to it all the time in the car. My kids love it, too. Um, wh- what else do you have coming up? What, what, are, what are some uh, new projects you have on the agenda? Um, well, right now, I've, uh, I'm, I'll be, uh, over the next few months, I'll be delivering these workshops in uh, public schools over here in the Toronto area. Um, I'm on the surface, they're drumming workshops, but really what they're dealing with is issues of identity, um, specifically in neighborhoods that have a high concentration of Muslims or even like other immigrants. Um, and just, you know, dealing with, you know, concepts of hyphenated identities that you're not really just Canadian or just Jamaican or just Pakistani. You're all of those and it's okay. Um, and just, uh, you know, getting people to transcend imaginary boundaries 
uh, in their expression of creativity uh, uh, and appreciating, uh, you know, things from, you know, expanding their horizons, really, uh, but also becoming comfortable with who they are in themselves. And that is okay to be different and, uh, and you know, be Canadian at the same time. So I'm doing that um, in the short run. Uh, pre-production for the next album has already begun, and I'm really excited with the kind of stuff that we have on it. Um, it's some really interesting medleys, uh, you know. Uh, uh, you know, some. Uh, it, it just, I'm just really, really excited. Uh, we have already spoken with a couple of producers. One based in Brazil, one based in uh, San Francisco, uh, and um, you know, connecting with recording engineers here in Toronto. Um, and you know, exploring many ways in which we can tighten down the timeline for for producing the album and having it out. Um, and just like the last album, in the, in the previous album, we we crowdfunded the production funds, and we oh, did really? some extra fundraising as well. Because I, I, we had investors, we told them we, we we don't want your money because then your entire outreach strategy and marketing strategy is centered around uh, giving people back their money. Sure, right? sure, sure. So, and we wanted this thing to be bigger than money, bigger than the music, uh, which is why we crowdfunded the production funds so then we can do whatever the heck we wanted with the money without answering to anybody. Right. And our commitment was to give all of the sales proceeds away into charity, into Esa the Qajaria. And we wanted to do water because it's just so basic. And providing water in communities deprived of it is, it makes such a fundamental shift in the local economy, the local culture, the local everything, really. Uh, so we, you know, and then we sought out organizations that are specialists in what they do, and we've, you know, connected with them, became their, you know, they became our implementation partners. And so all the funding, all the sales of, the, of that album are funneled towards these guys, Water Aid Canada. Um, and so similarly, the next album, we are looking to crowdfund and fundraise the production funds for it. We're looking to raise 60 grand again. And 100% of that, of the proceeds of that will be going towards um, a specific charity cause. At this point, we haven't decided yet which one that would be. So that is still uh, something that we're working on. So all of the, I'm really excited about that. Plus, uh, you know, I have, a, I have a band of drummers now. Um, and uh, which is just as culturally varied as I am, I suppose. We have, <laughs> uh, you know, somebody playing a Cuban drum. We have somebody playing an Indian tabla. We have somebody playing a duff, uh, a 12-piece drum kit, all of that. Uh, and, you know, and uh, inshallah they'll be featured on the next album. So we are right now preparing for um, a few live gigs here and inshallah a tour of Canada uh, later, uh, early next year. So lots of exciting stuff's happening. Wow, fantastic! Well, if if people want to keep up with you, uh, do you, do you have a web presence uh, that uh, uh, people well, can follow? I have a Facebook page. As far as I know, I'm the only Nader Khan on Facebook who sings. If you find another one, tell me, and I'll kill him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, my, with, my kindness, web... with kindness, <laughs> with kindness. Yeah, kill, I'll kill him softly with love. Yeah, kill him softly. <laughs> <laughs> killing him softly yeah, with great. my songs killing okay uh, I do have a website but it is not live yet because there's a lot of glitches in it that we are still fixing I mean it's live people can see it but right now it's horrible and we're still getting it fixed and I'm not sure exactly what the timeline will be for that but hopefully soon but up until then people are welcome to connect with me on, on my page on Facebook I have a personal profile but that's for family and friends uh, so if you send me an ad request and I don't know you, <laughs> you, you know, it's better for you to connect to my page. There you go. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm on Facebook and you can connect with me over there. I'm on Twitter and Instagram as well. Um, Perfect. All right. Well, yeah. I mean, if, if people want to keep up with all of the projects that you have coming up, that's, a, I mean, there's plenty of avenues to do that. Yes, absolutely. I'll be announcing it over there. And, uh, yes, inshallah. Perfect. Well, as we wrap things up, Pervez, you want to let our audience know where they can reach out to us? Absolutely. Uh, well, first of all, thank you again, Nader. Uh, wonderful conversation. Um, as we often say, you know, one episode is never enough with any of thank our you. guests, it seems. Thank you for having me. It's, it's, it's an honor and a pleasure to have this. You know, you've, you've uh, asked me questions that I've never been asked before, and I really appreciate that because it's not the same, you know, you know rehearsed answers that I'm, you know, I'm, I've actually had to sit and think about what I'm saying. 
Well, so, thank right. you so much for, for, for putting me through that experience. I really <laughs> No, and we get that a lot. And, and we, we take it as a, <laughs> even though it's, it makes probably, uh, makes for a guest a little bit uncomfortable, but it does make for a refreshing conversation. Oh, no, I love it. Thank you so much. Yeah, which is the intent. So thank you so much for saying that as well, Nader. Um, but yeah, so it was a pleasure having Nader on. Uh, people can find us on, um, they can email us with questions, comments, suggestions at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. Uh, we are also on Facebook, uh, facebook.com slash diffusecongruence. Please leave a comment, your thoughts again. Also, do leave us a star rating on iTunes, Stitcher Radio. Uh, where else are we? Pod, you know, and various and sundry places where you find podcasts. Yeah, pretty, pretty much if you Google the phrase Diffuse Congruence, I think we'll come up. That's right. So If there's thank another you for... Diffuse Congruence podcast, let us know. We'll kill it. <laughs> <laughs> well played. Well played, <laughs> indeed. So thanks a lot, folks, for listening. Uh, we look forward to having you back next time with another exciting guest and conversation. Thank you for listening.